exception into this complicated time we're in. It gives proprio perception and indicates the extent and limits of the body, the uh, sense perceptions as well as the vast expanse of our minds. And of course, we're in a place that's looking at mind, that's looking at ways to uh, literally decolonize our own minds. So um, one may be engaged in long investigative projects that last a lifetime. There are ecological investigations, historical and philosophic and scientific investigations, creating new ecological forms, artistic forms, epic animalia that shift and dart and have a palpable symbiosis with the non-human, with those non-human elementals. To iterate, we have all this available and we are called to work on these kinds of uh, hybrids and hybrid text performances, languages that blur at the edges and uh, see them as well as cultural interventions often of outrage and of a kind of uh, power. New styles of the uh, rhizomic interfaces found as at, at or stolen text, uh, antics, hypertext, meta narratives, image interface, allegory, modal structures, performative strat strategies, and so on, to obviate the darkness of our time. These are some of the forms that I've been listening, I've worked with in my teaching and in my own reading and writing practices, as well as the elegant, still verdant possibilities and torques with this Anglo English formal verse that I came to. Uh, born to, and what I glean from other realms, the culture, the street, the world, the vocabularies of science and outer space. So it's a generative, exciting time for the creative and scholarly and cross-cultural work so many of us are engaged with. We are, sorry, we might ask the famous Adorno question daily, however, as the planet news sears our consciousness. I mean, it's such a crazy time. So I was coming over here, Chris Christie had just endorsed Donald Trump. <laughs> um, planet, <laughs> okay, so that says it all. So it's, it's, this, this is kind of searing time. We have to keep our sense of humor always, but it's da dangerous too. And it's this unmitigated barrage of violence, suffering, acts of pathological cruelty. So the question, can there be beauty? Can there be uh, creative acts after atrocity? And I think this is something one is considering all the time. And I, you know, I've, I've felt in, in these years at Naropa, these 40 some years, the uh, resounding response in the affirmative for creative acts as practice, creative acts as spiritual practice, and one feels a necessity, in fact, in, in the kind of pulse. We no longer have the leisure to question uh, doing, creating these alternative uh, spaces and worlds and, and ways that we can work with our very endangered language as well. Um, so something sings in us as an urgent exhortation to, and it was a slogan we had in the early days of founding the Kerouac School, something that Alan felt strongly, you know, when you're asked what is the point of all this, the idea is to wake, help wake the world up to itself. So, you know, thinking of that as the, uh, the, the purpose, and while I'm here, and what's the work to ease the pain of living everything else, drunken dumb show, which was a quote, that's a quote from one of Alan's poems, Henry Gardens. And so also to attend as Blake summons us to the little ones, the minute particulars of fragile existence, the minute particulars of our work, our daily work, moment to moment work, with the phones and phonemes of our mammal thrum. This has always been the case, it is still and more so the case. And uh, I like to remember this, you know, this is wonderful Buddhist um, exhortation, part of a, a litany that says, don't tarry, don't tarry, don't tarry, uh, no time to waste. So I've been asking this question, what does it mean to be contemporary with one's time? This is a question from uh, Gertrude Stein in her text, What Are Masterpieces? And in her text, Composition is Explanation. And then we have Ezra Pound's dictum, in the mind of the poet, all times are contemporaneous, which turns us to the great mystery and beauties of the archaic and to how so much of the modernist poetics we inherit comes from those very palpable discoveries in 
Walt Whitman's day and what we still feed off of, the decipherment of the Rosetta Stone, the discovery of cuneiform Gilgamesh, the discovery as well of, of, of libraries old as cities, of the Chaldean sense that chaos meant without a library. So what are the new discoveries that inflect and infect our poet consciousness? What new psychic inscriptions or magic of animal being or plant being, the wonders of the continuum, are continuing proof that we are not alone to earth our charge? So what is our connectivity, our adhesiveness, our pratityat samutpada, Sanskrit for the co-arising and interconnectedness of all phenomena, all things, all living things? So Gombin suggests that the poet, the contemporary, must firmly hold his gaze, his or her gaze, on his or her own time so as to perceive not its light, but rather its darkness. The contemporary is, and I'm paraphrasing Agamben, the contemporary is the person who perceives the darkness of the time as something that concerns him or her as something that never ceases to engage one. Darkness is something that turns directly towards one. The uh, contemporary is the one whose eyes are struck by the darkness that comes from this time, from his or her own time. He goes on to discourse on how the neurophysiology of vision, the absence of light, activates a series of peripheral cells in the retina called off cells. And when activated, these cells produce the particular kind of vision we call darkness. Darkness is not a privative notion, however, but rather the result of these off cells, a product of our own retina. In an expanding universe, the most remote galaxies move away from us at a speed so great that their light is never able to reach us. What we perceive as the darkness of the heavens is this light that, though traveling toward us, cannot reach us, since the galaxies from which the light originates move away from us at a velocity greater than the speed of light. To perceive in this darkness of the present this light that's trying to reach us but cannot, this is what it means to be contemporary. So he talks about fixing one's gaze on the darkness of the epoch we live in, but also being able to perceive in this darkness this, this, this light that as wholly directed towards us just as it is distancing itself from us. So this notion of both, both, of these things going on simultaneously, it's like negative capability, these, so, you know, this wonderful uh, conundrum and very, very powerful. So in other words, it's like being on time for an appointment that one cannot help but miss. So that leaves us in a struggle to grasp our time with a form of, you know, it's, it's too early, it's too early, or it's too late, or it's already happened, or that it's not yet happened. So I think poetry and this other, all this work we're doing, this I know that a lot of the new students are working in prose form, so uh, when I say poetry and poetics, you're Everything's included. I just want you to know that. So these, the, this work that we're, this writing, this um, scribing that we're doing has to move to some of this liminal behavior into the aporia, into this gap, into this both, both, this negative capability of imagination being positioned in or within the doorway. So I find an image from, and I think it's coming up on one of the slides. This is a, just a, a sort of, um, personal photo album, and I thank H.R. Hegnauer for helping pull that together. I wanted to welcome the new students with some images from this, the, the setting here. But anyway, this image from uh, Balinese dance is very useful here. When the dancer is poised in the archway, which is called the Chandi Bentar, uh, static, you know, poised in the archway, waiting to come out from the inner temple into the uh, outer temple, into the public space, uh, the, the masked figure, usually it's a, a masked figure, is static yet trembling uh, and sort of paralyzed, not being able to move forward, not being able to move back. And often that can go on this kind of stance for, you know, 20 minutes or more. So 
this, this notion of being, and I think this is the problem, if you're living in a sense of it's already happened and it's not happened yet, you can become very paralyzed. And I think I feel this, I mean, especially in these times, uh, one feels that. What, how do we act with all this um, uh, pathology around us? How do we communicate? How do we speak? How do we do our work? How do we uh, have a kind of um, maintain a sort of spiritual practice and stay on, uh, hold our seat, hold our ground, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, hold the space? as Akilah Oliver used to say all the time. How do we hold the space? And so, and how do we act within that if we feel paralyzed? And how, how do we act when we feel fear? And, how, and what is that fear about? How do we, what, what, what are we frightened of in this um, dark time? And how can we flip that into seeing it as a generative time with these, neuro, these busy, busy off cells that actually are are creative. They're not. They're not dead. They're not dead in the darkness. So, uh, how do we break this par paralysis? How do we shift the frequency? Uh, curiosity helps. Uh, Isterin helps. This notion of finding out for oneself the root of the word history, and one of the um, biggest questions is, uh, you know, how how do do we find a uh, our practice, how do we uh, maintain uh, a, a way of, uh, you know, working with all the, you know, right livelihood, right attitude, all these um, ways to maintain our body, speech, and mind, and keep sane. The economics are very hard, of course. And um, so what, you know, and then what do we draw on? What other cultures and languages and practices and philosophical passions and fields of scholarship and so on can we draw on together? So in our, you know, in, in all this, we, we're, we're getting more attuned to the weather of our existence. The climate of our being is what we investigate, especially in this difficult time, in a time where climate is a literal issue and uh, where the danger is no longer just from the evil tyrants, but from this, more this banality of evil, you know, which is nothing new, uh, as Hannah Arendt calls it, that's her term, or you know, a frightening, almost fascistic normality in a world where most of the denizens are not that, in, or many, it seems, not that interested in the plants and animals and the fates thereof, not the earth and the stars, uh, and have only made perhaps a marginal awareness of the um, of political and moral and ethical dereliction, or that that dereliction becomes acceptable. And you know, when the fact that global warming can be denied at this point is just one example of this kind of dereliction, dereliction of, of attention, of, uh, of intelligence. So, you know, when we are facing this possible sixth extinction, not that there haven't been other extinctions, but uh, we've certainly contributed to it in this difficult Anthropocene. So in a world of power holders, the deciders who manipulate mass attention on mediated narcissistic, on these narcissistic realms, on, you know, useless stuff, where we are mere subjects toyed with when we aren't being oppressed, uh, creating you know, citizens that vote, if they vote, against their own best interest. Um, is this some kind of suicidal death wish? Are we in, enthralled to some strange, um, uh, you know, un, some strange, you know, fate almost? But to summon, the alternative is to summon a poetics that is consistently participatory, a poetics that shifts the gaze toward a greater ethos. The Dalai Lama and others talk about how we can no longer resolve problems by ourselves. We need one another. Hence this, you know, this term I use a lot, pratityat samatpada, Buddhist term for this interconnectedness. We need to develop a sense of universal responsibility. It's our collective and individual responsibility to protect and nurture the global family, to support the weaker members. I mean, just thinking daily of these uh, migrants and the extraordinary suffering that people are, are going through, and the, you know, that how things are so out of kilter and out of whack. And, um, and to develop practices where we include 
that we are, are able to include, you know, the images and the information that we actually are, um, can, can extend our empathy to, to visualize through visualization, through study, through reading, through coming to um, other cultures and languages, and to individuals who are in these kinds of uh, difficult circumstances. So this has always been one of the, you know, t practices of this school, and it is certainly, you know, having it be founded by Ginsburg with Diane de Prima in the mix, and uh, myself, and this this grounding in um, a, a you know serious activism, putting your body on the line, speaking you know speaking to truth to power, and so on. So what's needed is this. Um, the imagination of many different kinds of individuals with all their talent and aspiration. Um, let's see, I wanted to then go to part, two. I'm just skipping around a little here. Um, so I came of age with this so-called New American Poetry, the nexus of the New York School, the Beat Literary Movement, San Francisco and Black Mountain Schools and Black Arts, a wild ride to some extent, especially as a female. I cut my teeth in numerous face-offs. The hardest, perhaps, was William Burroughs, who, when I first met him, was champi championing the idea that women were expendable, men could, be birth, could birth offspring through their anuses, and so on. But I wanted a poesis that believed the past was not simply a husk that we had to, you know, destroy the, you know, what had come before and stomp on the, the corpses of our elders, but it, that allowed the arcade to infuse our psyche to, um, and so growing from this view, the, the, the sense of, um, you know, a more generative, and we talk about prajna or pragna here, and, uh, the feminine principle of putting makeup on empty space, and then when we founded Naropa, there was so much female energy, and the notion was of, you know, creating an, an environment that was, like, you know, like the womb in a way, where things could actually start to happen and, and take place. But one also, as a as, you know, as a younger writer, coming up through, primarily a you know a male, sort of dominant male poetry culture, one went, there were always the great resources from the past. So you go to, to Li Ching Chow and the female troubadours and the, the Countess of Dia to Sappho, HD, Virginia Woolf, et cetera, et cetera. And, it, and this is very sustaining. You create your own, um, Paiduma, your own uh, school in a way. And then also thinking about a field of, you know, this utopian creative field that could be this place where we are defined by our energy, not by our constructs of gender. I proposed a transsexual literature, a hermaphroditic, liter hermaphroditic literature, a transvestite literature, and finally tra a transformation beyond gender. gender. So um, the sense of reclaiming also this, this idea of being contemporary with the time, but on the mind of the poet, all time are, times are contemporaneous. Uh, you can't ever, you know, if you start to think about it, you can't ever personally inhabit a, a sort of solipsistic klysura or an island of salvation. So the hermeneutics would be hermeneutics would be to interpret texts along with students and others with that root of you know that particular science clearly in the mind. Hermes as the guard of liminal margins and boundaries, guardian of sleep and transformation. Hermes who guards the dead. So. Um, that was also key in a way. And I also joke about this being the path of the avant derriere, the before behind. Um, let's see, I wanted to read, reference the wonderful book by Robert Duncan, the HD book, which is a terrific tome that mediates and explores the roots of modernism and its particular manifestation in the work of women writers that also explores looking into the darkness of the time. One of his major works is Before the War, not in the temporal sense, but as standing before it. So that's the, another image of, you know, being in the, being in the hall in the, uh, chan under the Chandy Bentar kind of paralyzed but you're, you're standing before, you know, the, the, the reality in a way and, um, and, and facing it. Having Duncan um, 
you know, actually in, in this book, he also with great erudition and devotion illuminates the role women played in the creation of modernism. And he references particularly the poet Muriel Rukeyser, who was a feminist and activist. And this is a dream of hers that he um, includes in this text. What returned to my thought as I began work this morning was the revelation of the stars. For the dream, Muriel Rukeyser, the poetess of the major arcana of my own dream tarot, took us out to see the night sky. All the stars of the cosmos had come out from the remotest regions into the visible. At first, I was struck by the brilliance of Orion, but as I looked, the field was crowded with stars, dense cells of images, and then almost animal constellations of the night sky. It was as if we saw the whole overpopulated species of man, and in that congregation of the living and the dead, the visible and invisible members of the whole, we began to make out patterns of men, of animal entities, whose cells were living souls. We see these skies here, the poet has said, because we are very close to the destruction of the world. If we were truly cyborgian, human, animal, machine, although born from militarism and patriarchal capital, we could inhabit a world without genesis, perhaps, a world without end, but I feel this begin again, even at the brink of destruction. The darkness is a generative time. Quantum physics talks about the myriad directions of time and space. Let's enter every one of them. This is what artists can do best. And Duncan asked me once, echoing Ginsburg, and what is your end cause? What is your desire? I desire the continuing radical dissonance and magic and wit and activism in a practice of poesis and being part of the continuum of word workers carrying sifting, shifting narrations in public space. Also desiring a path away from a language culture of death, empire, and displacement and would advance a decolonial, decol decol I can't even say it. Anyway, a turf, advance a, uh, a place to hold dear the body politic. So some of the practices that uh, I'm engaged with and many of us have been engaged with of, of all the more uh, alternative schools and practitioners, practitioners of many uh, decades now, a poem is allowed to chronicle the history of its own making. The mind of the poet could also be the subject of the poem. Indeterminacy as paralleled in music and painting Writing as continuous present, which is Stein, of course. Poetry is collaboration with language, language over logic, which leads to certain moves. And um, not so much concern with the final form, but engagement with the medium of language and imagination itself. Let sentences start and stop, like one's attention, and then instability of meaning or logic. So that's the other thing, you know, the curiosity of, and the inquiry and the instability of having to know it all or be, you know, fixed in your shapes and forms. If the relation between word and world and concept is arbitrary, then one's attitude to language has to change. And, and finally, it's very physical, these acts of art. And therefore, our bodies are very precious things. We have to take care of our bodies to continue this work that we need to do. And my larynx instructs me thus, proclaims a vocal imagination and a trust in that. Was Homo ergaster the first hominid to vocalize? And what did she say? The larynx descended. We have an L-shaped vocal tract and how phonemes may also be produced on the outside of the body. Language is not a separate adaptation, but an internal aspect of some much wider symbolic culture. And when you find human, you find poetry and capacity for song and impulse gathered from the rambunctious animal that sways and sings in sound and body motion. Biopoetics, bio, biopoetics, oikos symbiosis, something catches on. Something is catching on. What is this darkness stalking my imagination? Art is not empire building. It deterritorializes de empire. In evolutionary, in evolutionary terms, humans, homo sapiens sapiens, have only just arrived. We are early on in our development. We can't trace ourselves back more than a few thousand years. We are juvenile, still learning to be human, perhaps and still learning to be artists. Uh, this book that Eileen was turning everyone, Eileen Miles was turning every, 
I went on to last summer, the uh, Beatrice Preciado's book, which I think some of you have read, Testo Junkie. Um, this is part two now. A few little additional notes here. Outrider, scholar, and philosopher Beatrice Preciado, whose book Testo Junkie, a book with radical textual experimentation, has been compared to the work of Burroughs. And she has some very fascinating prophetic and prescient uh, analysis. Preciado talks about how we are living in a punk, cyber, gothic middle ages of the bioinformation empire. We are swimming in nuclear semen in which we are learning to breathe like mutant beasts. Some, in her view, think that the, con the contemporary civilization has substituted an industrial or ergot-like foundation for ontotheology, but nothing explains the present functioning of our societies. The contemporary techno-porno-punk empire relies on new slogans, consume and die, have an orgasm and make war, and don't forget to continue to consume and to come after you die. This is the thanato-pornographic foundation of this new empire. Our presence to ourselves as a species, Preciado con continues, could be described as, her term is prosthetico-comatose, Quote, we have closed our eyes, but we continue to see by means of an array of technologies, political implants that we call life, culture, civilization. It is, however, only through the strategic reappropriation of these biotechnological apparatuses that it is possible to reinvent resistance to risk revolution. So she invokes a new porno punk philosophy as we wait to morph and change, uh, and change plan even change planets and revolt. Let us be worthy of our own fall, is our rallying cry. So this cry of hers is a certain. Well, she's actually trans. Uh, I think she's. I should be calling her her him. This is recent. It's, it's a certain. It's a alain d'esprit and global consciousness. Of, uh, of a kind of resistance that I find very refreshing and also conjures a, a kind of risky revolution. Um, the International Anthropocene Working Group published a paper recently suggesting that the Trinity test on July 16th, 1945 was the start of the Anthropocene. The bomb whose nuclear semen we are swimming in is a good poetics marker, I think, for my consociational generation and are waking up to these particular exigencies. So that, you know, sometimes you have to find the markers in your own life of, of um, where that, dark, you know, where the darkness has entered, what the interventions have been, what are you uh, working with, what are you resisting or taking on. Whom bomb, we bomb them, whom bomb, we bomb them, whom bomb, we bomb them, what do we do, we bomb, we bomb them, what do we do, we bomb, we bomb them, what do we do, we bomb them. Stop damned robot wars, stop damned robot wars, stop damned robot wars. So this is Ginsburg, Allen Ginsburg in 1967, in 1976, and he took inspiration for this much more extended piece which he recited all over the world after a particular trip to Arnheim Land in Australia in a lecture which is in our Cross Worlds book at, at here at Naropa in this room Jack at the Jack Kerouac School. Uh, he, discusses, he discusses epic spontaneous poetics and aboriginal song sticks and he highlights the aboriginal epic in the pit John, Chara language, which takes decades to create, it is perhaps the Earth's oldest poetic form, and it takes 40 years to become a songman. The Yurkala tribe composes an epic that takes, uh, I mean, you're working on it these 20 to 40 years. It involves travel instructions on a certain migration pattern. This wandering epic might also involve the total beauty of the terrain that the tribe is going to circumambulate, where you can find water holes, what kind of vegetation is found, what kind of food, where the witchetty grubs are, where you can find firewood, that, and, and, these, and lo, various local landmarks, and how all these things are connected in eternal dream time to the origin of the earth and of the tribe. Where is the best place to have games? Where is the bless, best place to make love? What is the actual history, how far back can you go? 
And the song man uses a very simple form for all this, a one-line verse that is repeated by the entire tribe. So this poet has in his, in, in his her head the entire stock of words and information. Uh, again, what are the bird sounds? What are the, in, how do they sound differently in the different seasons? Where the sun rises, where the moon will set. And this job is to keep track of everything. And the entire uh, community is dependent on this, on this poet, who, as Ginsburg says, has the equivalent of the Encyclopedia Britannica in, in the head and is the one who knows how to survive in specific places. Uh, Al Alan held this analogy to what the role of the poet could be and should be. It was his own self-appointed role. No one asks, nobody's down on their knees asking you to be a writer, asking you to do this work. Um, but somehow you, you self uh, appoint yourself to, to do the best you can to keep track of anything, of everything. So, you know, I would just posit this, you know, this kind of body of what we've been doing here, it's rep very represented in our ar archive as a testimony to that kind of role of uh, keeping track of everything, is covering the waterfront, as Ted Berrigan used to say. And especially, as I'm saying here in this world, you know, this very traumatized world with the monumental uh, fuck-ups of man and Alan, uh, and, uh, and also all the other traumas, the personal traumas we all suffer. So he took the Buddha, a Buddhist vow to benefit other sentient beings who were once very one's own parents and what else was there to do in the Anthropocene. Threads of desire constantly broken, strings plucked and snapped. The fix is in for the hungry ghost who sings in lamentation, singing to be a ghost and so very hungry. The fix is in, the fix is in. Attachment, which is a ghost of yearning, yearning for existence. The fix is in, yearning for sustenance. Hungry ghosts of the Jurassic, large omnivores startling you with appetite. So to continue, one of the most seminal and perhaps fortuitous occasions I feel in the world of contemporary poetics and the world of uh, meditative, contemplative psychology and awareness and Buddhist practice um, and meditation was the arrival of Chögyam Trungpa into a very particular environment in the United States, states which included what is referred to historically the new American poetry. His primary contacts were with poets and writers associated with the beat literary movement branch of the New American Tree, and there's a long list here. You're seeing images of them, Diane de Prima, William Burroughs, Corso, Philip Whalen, Joanne Kiger, and many others who were here, Amidi Baraka, who were here, the founding of this school. So this unprecedented conjunction fostered this uh, school, birth of this school in 1974, and it expanded to include a range of others, you know, included um, Scholars, artists, playwrights, dancers, political and cultural activists, filmmakers, translators, psychologists, as well as guests from other cultures and traditions, uh, primarily Zen, Native American, Christian, and Jewish mystic. Trungpa, a reincarnated tulku meditation teacher, or Rinpoche, literally precious one in the Buddhist and Shambhala traditions, had been writing poetry in his own tradition and language for some time, and had also composed masterful sadhanas, or practice liturgies, that came from these meditative states or mind transmissions called terma. He was a master calligrapher as well and a catalyst for a prodigious range of projects which involved meditation centers, the Maitri programs, retreat sites, seminaries, a body of orally transmitted teachings, and the development of strong sanghas or spiritual communities in the US and around the world. He taught what is referred to here as dharma art on many occasions here in this room, in this and at, at Naropa, as, as Reed Bai has written in an essay on these specific teachings, quote, Dharma means something like form or isness and refers to the experience of things as they are, free from projections. Art comes from an Indo-European verb root meaning to fit together. Dharma art then refers to anything perceived and put together from the unbiased openness of original mind. Meditation is the practice of gaining direct familiarity with this openness. So to come back to this idea of the off-cells and the generative off-cells in the neurophysiology of our uh, brains uh, that can look into the darkness and actually generate in, in the darkness. I think there's a, a link there. Trungpa was an indefatigable activity demon. 
He died in 1987. Um, Alan, let's see, a, has an interesting sketch about him. Reincarnated Lama, trained from age two in various ancient practices, aimed at concentrating attention, focusing perception, minding thought forms to transparency, vast in consciousness, annihilating ego, and immolating ego mind and phenomena, a wizard in control of daydream, conscious visualization and thought projection, vocal sound vibration, outward application of insight, practice of natural virtues, and a very admiral of oceanic scholarship thereof. So this is just something about the, you know, the founding and the ground. And so we were not an English department. Just going to remind everybody. <laughs> um, I think I'm going to probably stop there. The, um, but I did want to mention something about the archive and how Jacques Derrida has mulled over the subject of archive with great attention in his book, Archive Fever, conjuring a sense of permanence, of motive, from the psychological sense of a power move to establish canon, and so on, a source of irony that a school based on uh, the meditative tenets of impermanence should hold so dear its legacy, which from some point of view one could say the world needs so that creative and spiritually minded people of the future, should any remain, will comprehend that not everyone in this historical time frame was caught up in a maelstrom of greed, violence, and war psychosis. Uh, Trumpa often spoke of the dangers of the four lords of materialism. That's another subject. But, um, but institutionalization, for want of a very better word, in a way of this creative um, experiment, uh, inspired in part by this, this sort of theory and, pra and contemplative practice. And um, Trungpa himself wanted, and it's somewhat, you know, the beginnings of certainly his various Buddhist teachings have, are in a comprehensive library in Nova Scotia. And he, sp he spoke about a difficult time when, uh, you know, a more fascistic time when we would be, our, our very gnosis of, from many, many traditions would be threatened. Um, have these, you know, like the Mormons have, underground libraries and places to hold, since our minds can no longer memorize all this great stuff, just to hold the, uh, you know, these precious poetries and literatures and teachings and, and um, language treasures into the future. So this idea of, of uh, making, keeping that uh, dear, and, you know, you should all be thinking along those, you know, t taking... Uh, pride it, about, with how you um, care for your work, and, and think of the think of it as a body, as an ongoing body. Many constitutional civil liberties threatened here. That's one of the problems: quality of education waning, corporate media controlling information, narrow Christian fundamentalist theocracy holding sway. Seems less tolerance for difference and the creative imagination. Of course, we're seeing all sorts of incredibly great upheavals and. Uh, things are moving and changing. It's, we'll see, we'll see. Um, religious conflict, which are, you know, it's, one might see these are power struggles masked as religious ideology or pandemic. The planet itself is threatened by criminal stewardship. Uh, Whitman warned in Democratic Vistas that unless American materialism was tempered by a spiritual influence, the United States would turn into the fabled damned of nations. And the antidote was adhesiveness between citizens and candor of poets and orators to come. And I remember Trunkwa once he once commenting on this image, Whitman's image of universal transitory, transitoriness, transitoriness in the poem Crossing Brooklyn Ferry, and how those were like sutras in this perception. This is not to shift the tone to one of doom and apocalypse, but rather to make the point that that there was a sort of far-sighted vision. And when we spoke of, you know, this being a 100-year project, there was, uh, you know, that was, for me, a real um, inspiration to, you know, move here and put, and put, you know, put one's body into this. And the, I wanted to just reference the, the term tendril, which uh, translates as auspicious coincidence. So that was also very clear at the beginning. You know, we're not here by, it's, some, it's not some kind of thing on high and placing us here and it's all just karma and fate, but something about that. There's some reason why this adhesiveness has, has happened and can, can happen with lots of pitfalls and shifts and so on. I'm, you know, got to hang in. I've been hanging in a long time. I urge all of you to do so as well. 
So this tendril, this auspicious coincidence that has empowered the life and work of so many individuals and the numerous people who've been through these uh, gates and continue to flock to this uh, place to maintain, you know, a kind of continuity of, and, you know, this intelligent and, and uh, magnificent adhesiveness. So uh, one more little thing here. And then there's, this goes on to talk about some of the work of the early founders and the you know, connections to uh, particularly Buddhism with people like Philip Whelan and De Prima and Kiger and so on and how that, you know, but I wanted to make the point that this, this was a very auspicious conjunct that somehow New American poetry and this contemplative practice could come together at this time in uh, American you know, belletristic time, and that it's, uh, again, ten I want to invoke Tendrell, very auspicious, and also, see, in, in a way, as I said, where it's just the beginning, to some extent, how, that can, how this can play out. So this was um, just a little response to the Poetry Project newsletter asking what poetry can do, do that nothing else can. The invention of the unknown demands new forms, Rambo. I listened to the gravitational winds the other night, sonic ripples of energy coursing through our cosmos, space and time, merging black holes. I sang with them, putting words awry on their coasts. Dragar, rum, mama, swill, lil, bidden rise. Rosa comes, mumsa, diadem, dim, 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 obsidian, a new lap, and royal a woo, a woo, nonsense for the cold stars. My ears are giant pink shells open wide. My body swells with the sounds that are trapped in it. I hear the bleeding of great pan. I hear the vermilion music of the sun. Hugo Ball. I've always felt necessity to take poetry to an oral and public space, demanding its throaty body be exposed, larynx on fire, reanimate the phones of an exquisite delight, phonemes of an intervention, a wild mind document cut, it, cut into space and sound. What, what else so sly, so pleasing, so modest, and the pleasure it sounds from a book? A book! Privacy, soft interiors of dulcet or galactic rampant soundings, interior concert halls in the head, gone on this inkling a long time, founding a school around it, saying boldly, poetry helps wake up the world to itself as a cosmic mirror through which the writer, the poet, the scribe, scries and prophesizes and identifies, celebrates, castigates in alternative space and mourns in human language. Marion Moore could write about unicorns etched like an equine monster of an old celestial map beside a cloud or dress of Virgin Mary blue. She would claim her poems as flies in amber for others, it's time bombs. The light weeks fly, and I do not understand what has happened. How for you, my darling son, the white knight looked into the jail and will look again with the eye of hawk and speak to you of your high cross and of death, Anna Akhmatova. Earlier, she wrote, your lips held the cold of an icon. I won't forget the deathly sweat on your forehead. I will go like the wives of the Streltsies. Streltzy dead and howl under the towers of the Kremlin. Your husband murdered, your son in lockdown. And poetry must and might thus prize samsara from within its terrible syndicate, expose impostors, reanimate sentient beings to a fearless, radical, revolutionary, turning language always. What claims me in the dark of night, roiling in a way that feels salient, wise, possible, oh, impossible, inconsolable, irreparable world, generative? Poetry restores love, intellect, a singular adventure of imagination, and breaks lazy language habit. I want to be a stream tuner, unfurled in tongues that want belong, won't belong in anybody's mouth, mass swerving from the law of tongues. Let me slip my slack tongue speech in your ear, the burnt starry star of all love in your ear. Oh, for a muse of fire music, Fred Moten. So I'm going to read um, from Voice's Daughter of a Heart Yet to be Born. Then we can have a brief uh, little Q&A. So have not read this before. And, uh, okay, this title, Voices Daughter of a Heart Yet to be Born, Voices Daughter, Bat Kol, the Bat Kol, which is Hebrew, meaning Voices Daughter, and it's uh, seen as the 
voice of God in female form. So you, it, can, it could also be like an echo. It's not necessarily a quieter, gentler voice, but it comes in a different way, in a more subtle way. You might, it's the kind of voice sometimes you just hear in your head. At, um, not that you don't hear the actual voice of God in your head, but this is a different kind of voice. So but that's the Bot Cole. And then there's um, Daughters of a Heart Yet to Be Born is from uh, Antonin Artaud. In, uh, he wrote a piece called Fragmentations in the uh, last asylum he was in before his death in Rodez in France. And it's an interesting list of kind of made up female daughters and uh, one version includes Anais Nin. So I was doing some research and those two, the Bot Cole and the Arto came together in the title of this and I was very um, focused on a, a, a spin or a response or a meditation out of, uh, from and around Blake's Book of Thel, William Blake's Book of Thel, which is a short poem, really, six-page uh, text about the Thel, the unborn. She uh, comes to the mouth of the womb, has a conversation with a cloud and a, a worm and a lily flower and a clod of clay, and is shown her own birth plot. And uh, in seeing her birth plot and seeing the incredible suffering in the world, looking out through the womb, she runs screaming back to the veils of har or harmony and uh, takes up again with her virgin companions who are all unborn and are living in this kind of idyllic state of uh, innocence and from some point of view and it is sort of I take the poem is in two parts and I take it to uh, you know this in the second part of experience more like a state of dementia perhaps if you don't come into the world if you don't experience and then there's also the the thread of the notion of unborn from Buddhism, that there is no, it, it, there's no unborn, it's continuous. So that's a kind of interesting play. And the, uh, the notion of aborting or not coming in, not getting involved, not coming in. So this was very much uh, on my mind um, and going through my own sort of sense of recovery and, and so on and thinking about the, the um, you know, the, the mortal, the mortal coil. And then a letter came to the office. So this is about two and a half years ago, maybe, yeah, three years ago. And uh, came to the office here, addressed to uh, Dear Locator, said, I'm trying to locate Ann Waldman, Waldman, who appeared to me in a dream and uh, was was asking, was telling me to, where I could find a teacher in in Autun was was, uh, and so I'm writing to find out uh, who that teacher is. So this was very interesting. This kind of letter, and that also triggered another strand of the poem. So I'm going to read the this little digressive part from the book called Dear Locator, and I'm reading its prose. So I'm reading it for the pro, new pro students. Dear Locator. It was in the deep of summer the letter arrived addressed to the disembodied poetics locator and asking the whereabouts of its director. I had appeared in the writer's dream informing him of a teacher residing in Autun, France. What kind of teacher, I wondered, spiritual, educational, Rosicrucian, in the fields of poetry or performance, or as we now say, hybrid creative work? His was a hybrid dream. I had published a book entitled Helping the Dreamer some years back, Self-Fulfilling Prophecy. The madcap writer of the letter wanted further information on how to locate this apparitional teacher. In fact, requested that the disembodied poetics office send any information it might have that would further assist him in his quest. He also indicated we had had a cup of tea together once some years back in Sundance Square, a cafe in Austin, Oton, Texas. I had little recollection of this, yet it seemed a grounding and personal detail and assured me that the writer actually had me in his dream and not some other celebrated 
figure he wanted to loop into his mania, and I found myself searching my own recent dreams, wondering perhaps if we had crossed wires or psychic paths. I recalled a reoccurring dream within which a spiritual teacher now deceased, a reincarnated lama in the Buddhist tradition, generous man of great reputation, appeared to me, often instructing me and others on how to live underground when the dark ages, and they are coming, my friends, coming soon when they come would arrive and threaten our very existence, depriving us specifically of all the teachings we held dear, spiritual and literary practices from many wisdom traditions, Gnostic, Sufi, indigenous, Taoist, Celtic, Shinto, Diné, Cargo, Uralic, Rasta, Druze, etc., as well as tomes of poetry, literature, philosophy, in many marvelous tongues. And I remember here a question about music and how we would all need silencer microchips so we might, in our hidden dwellings below, stay quiet, not being attentive, not not bring attention to our vibrational presence, and in our role as guardians, protectors of the realms, as our Lama called us. We would not be able to move our bodies, sway or turn or stomp the ground in ecstasy with the music that was unheard in any case in public space. Rather, we would evolve a coded internal dance, pulse or rhythm known solely to us. We would be able to hook up together as the wizards of the upper Amazon did in their collective visions. We would live like moles in subterranean caverns without ritual implements or instruments. No flutes, no drums. We were designated as Illuminati, Templars, holders, elders, trance adepts, seers, progenitors, and the like. As with the magic practices of the Lakondon forest, we would all imbibe the same vision. This was in my repeating dream, as I have said, but this thought bubble, more like a vision on the yogas Naropa, let me call it, the yogas of Naropa, let me call it that, as the palpability of the tall, looming figure giving transmission gave my life responsibility and purpose and a sense of urgency. I tried to hone skills adept in the practices of preservation. I often imagined persons of the future being dismayed at how little remained of the civilizations in front of them, what knowledge and guides to the scintillating questions had been lost just as space exploration devices went off course and crashed and exploded in remote places. All that data compromised, or as memory waned, how little curious one those coming after would reclaim that knowledge. Know how to dance a polka, even a tarantella. What is a plan? What was a mask? How are you wired? Why did you, everyone, why did you want to know anything? And the enceladas of Sor Juana, what was a neuron and expurgated black box to explain all loss? It would enter warp space of the Anthropocene margin of many causes. Ground zero, familiar trope, raising of many cities, Gaza, Erbil, Tikrit, Aleppo, Homs, al Bakamel, Der Al-Zur, shifting sands, Alexandria still standing, local tribal hold, contested, border posts, Kurd-held maps of pain. Once when in an induced coma under surgeon's blade, I encountered the specter of one of dearest friends, an adept of biological spheres who could analyze glacial and animal majesties into their scientific components, setting coordinates of the multiverse to the rings of time in every redwood tree. As he departed this world, as he passed, as he went the great homecoming night of a full moon in April, he swerved toward me and we brushed arms in the bardo. We touched consciousness. I felt how to describe his tone, but as I came back to urgent and still undead, he turned away, fleeting down another well-lit corridor. Awake in the relative world, he had already departed the Chiricahua Apache charnel ground, close to the now no longer extinct Jaguar corridor, leaving behind a multi-rayed native blanket in a bed of flowers. Just a bit longer, I begged of no one in particular, because my traditions and practices were non-theistic. I was talking to myself, extend this life. My assistant was amused, yet wanted to get on with the business at hand, evaluations and requests and obligatory recommendations for positions of poetry in workaday mode, and seized the note, tossing it perfunctorily into the wastebasket, where I promptly retrieved it, seeing it as a possible useful and relevatory trigger. I needed a luminous detail, a rune, a conundrum, a paradox. I needed to keep writing to live, if nothing else, away into further dream work. It was starting to investigate various yogas and preparation for life after death states, the yogas of Naropa. Wanting to put my assistant's mind at rest that I was not drifting into a world of mindless occult meander, I resisted going on with some morbid patter about death dream yoga and the like, or why I might want to retain the messages from this 
Cook or Cook or what I was intrigued by in his note and told her of the nut file I'd kept for years. That was the cynic's response to protect my poet's excitement on the scent of a new adventure. I had trouble seated. I had trouble sitting at my workstation. There was a letter from the fellow with the same last name as mine who claimed we might already be related, and why would I not consider a marriage offer from him now in a new century? He owned a drugstore in Los Angeles and had all the drugs in the world at his reach and at my disposal, elixirs to counter any troublesome mood swing. To sweeten the proposal, he also offered his luxurious home by the water in Malibu where I could rest my weary limbs with saunas and steam rooms, interior and outdoor pools, and a limited with chauffeurs who would recite poetry to carry me with the greatest of ease on shopping trips or work engagements up and down the coast. Marijuana was also becoming legalized, he assured me. I could smoke freely in the car, which also had a full bar with marvelous health drinks, including booster shots and catch a fire with beets and cayenne pepper and body good with Swiss chard and ginger, just to name a few. This letter was in the file, and I did reply in some offhand fashion with regrets and a signed edition of a recent book. I never heard from him again. There was also a more recent letter from an individual who had proof that Jim Morrison, of 20th century poet rock fame renowned, was still alive and walking amongst us, and had taken up residency in our town and was enrolled, in fact, at the school where I worked. I had seen his gravesite at Père Lachaise. He was well underground with the worms by now. The letter writer appeared to be in a time warp, as Morrison would already be close to 80 years old, hardly a candidate for undergraduate education, although nothing is inconceivable, and we have had late education students enroll from time to time. Jim was shy, the letter indicated, and would do nothing himself to expose his true identity, and we were not requested to do anything either, just be aware that this mighty figure, this superstar, the Lizard King, the king of orgasmic rock, a hallowed art saint poet Modi was still embodied. From the tone of the letter, the writer did not seem to be aware of any passage of time. Jim was still youthful, had faked his death, and was already embarked on an academic path of accreditation and degree conference. Why would he need a poetry school anyway, I wondered. He was well versed in Rambeau, Artaud, Celine, Jack Kerouac. The file contained other sundry bits of adulation, complaint, plea, and requests of myself to send articles of intimacy. Sorry to rave on about the nut file, but a letter from one woman in particular touched me. The sender also spoke of being unborn or not born yet, and certainly hadn't, fa hadn't found her voice. I need to find my own voice. And of how my example of activism in the realms of poetry would help her make a decision to enter this strange life, the double variegated choiceless path of poet. She also said she had encountered me in a various ways, and although her heart had been hardened against me out of envy and something positive, I had said about William Carlos Williams once, she was a feminist, I was back in her good graces now as she had learned to accept William Carlos Williams as an ally. She had always been wary of doctors. She had apologized for any negative feeling. I have been wrong about you and William Carlos Williams, please forgive me. She had also had a medical poetry dream, a sure indicator of the fixation she now felt toward a female role model and groundlessness of being confused and wanting an elixir as in poetry is my medicine, poetry is the cure. Quite excessive. I sent her a grounded catalog full of the particulars of a rooted poetics. But in her dream, I was in the matrix, a large stone. She recounted we were in the state capitol she could make out certain landmarks, the needle, the Lincoln. We were suddenly being strafed by mandible drones and escaped through a manhole to an underground tunnel like World War II London. Remember Hilda Doolittle, she said. I then handed her a woven cloth from Nepal. She said, and how would this complete stranger know I had such a cloth? Still have it now after 40 years from trips to the Kali temple, much faded, a complex weave. She sensed I was also, and I am sure I was, but in some other direction, not fully active in all the things of this world. Crisscross, dream more prevalent in these days in the things of this world, I reckon. There were also missives recounting religious fixations. A boy who had escaped from a Christian cult but was now in a fiction cult, spelled fiction, fiction, F-I-X-T-I-N. Inductees worked 
on rewriting their lives. True memoir, actual fact was verboten. Then there was a boy on the front lines of the war in Iraq, angry that not enough of the beatniks had served in the military. He was writing from a foxhole in the middle of the desert. This was the first Gulf War. God was not happy about this, he said. Sleep of reason producing monsters. You know, someone said that men who meant to be wild, he said, should serve first. I thought this was a semi-profound statement. I mean about serving. On second thought, it's Puritan boy talk. The punk daughter of Mormon faith, who was enamored of William Blake the antinomian, as she referred to him, wrote to us initially, but actually visited our classrooms and had a band by similar name in a nearby local town, Blake and the Antinomians. She was at odds with her family for being a Blake-loving Mormon. We need to stick together, as one of the quorum of the Twelve said, scolding her and with scorn, with scorn as she recounted to me. And then what he said was, Blake had his own system, we have ours. I was curious and a bit uneasy that the quorum knew about William Blake, mistrusted him, and might use him against this delicate child of punk. What else did they have their eye on? The Muggletonians were certainly not in their book of prophecy. Mustafa, my companion of Egypt days, and our romantic time in the desert would often write to this address, my station, sending poems, but also plaintive requests. I'm still undocumented. Maybe you can help me get to the West, to our campfire conversation. He was in the middle of a revolution. This was not archival material for the nut file. I genuinely cared for him, but it sat alongside the appeal for help from the poet in Juarez, death threats at her door. This was the time of the horrible murders of young women from the Maquiadoras. To make the case for citizenship, we would work on that, write memos to the lawyer, letters of support. I thought about serving. Serving is roller coaster in that it may never end. Who to serve? What do you value, believe in, or passion about? Who to please? What put your life to? Tithe your time to serving with alacrity's vow to stay busy or let them walk over you as serving ever easy surrogate magic or taking over the host you serve. You could never serve enough at every angle you are serving microbes because at every angle you are serving microbes and they are endless. We were serving in our edifice, our evanescing office with the black mold growing under our daily bread. We were underpaid cultural workers. That was a lame joke about bread, Andrea said. Often communications of sympathy came in for the difficult weather we were enduring as we tried to maintain our academy, our alchemy. Floods had come and gone and may be back, one shaman from the Condomble tradition remarked. More blue water, you would serve weather if you understood it in the name of Ezekiel, said another, who hears the voice and sees the writing on the walls and so on. In some traditions, it is a female voice, this voice of God, or God's daughter rising through the Kabbalah. Presumably, one is caught off guard as you hear the dulcet voice of God through the female. You might miss here fires pandemic in these parts. The flood moved to higher ground, had washed away homes of close associates. Blue was an important meditation, as I said. We had driven around seeing huge fissures in the earth. Gigantic rocks had moved Promethean tasks, whole top topography shifting. You wonder about the call to being human. Were people rethinking their progeny? Born in this world, you got to suffer, shift a load to the Lord, and so on. End time prophets were getting to be a bore for some in the, some in, of the community with their end time pamphlets. Who hands out pamphlets anymore? Although many noticed the hail was growing larger and more frequent and more important to itself, egotistic, aggressive hail. Tornadoes were seen descending from the sky. This was the nut file in a nutshell, but there was more to come. Blurts out about the hail as if omen, and then one went, in, one went in a car to seek shelter, another accident, people in vehicles in intermediate years, constantly at risk, wait for the new light, rail, bullet, transport we'd voted for, promise of, of politicians along with amendments on personhood, a retro automobile hood is all we get, be a moth, scourge of the environment, and hit again, warning, will we please listen, end time, twisters, bodies, cryogenicized, this time I was offered a hand and a place to sit in a motor hotel in Ann Arbor next to the not yet murdered rock star, flowers for him, flowers for his tomb. Others live on in retirement. I wanted to be a locator for all my thought. Oh, help me, sundries of the collective home, bring all the dead rock stars back to one rock star walking among us. We would check the attendance sheets. 
Do rock stars ever die, the child asked. Did not want to die, I explained, kept singing in ragged voices till the cows come home. Influence on men like Calvinist idealism and dysnomia. Dear locator, be efficacious, be remembered. You are called by wrong name, chattel, bound feet, slave girl. Don't take that lightly over which elite guardians preside. Walk like an Egyptian. Could be woman you seek, ask mole who burrows under. A French revolution helping the dreamer America. Thunderous sound, old mole. Old, old mole, do poets ever die? Never! They never want to die except at the end of the poem. Explained it all like Dinanukt, Mandian demon from the marshes of southern Iraq who sits by the waters between worlds writing himself, half man, half book, writing as he reads a life sentence. Hail the size of transference, spectacle for end time, eloquence to size of fear, waiting a sentence, an intervention on any sentence, death knell. Children worry about being enshrouded while they are stuck in aporia, unaware how fear moves their elders. Lily, an adult, cloud explicitly mailed, clock of clay, what color, mysterious voices in clod realm masking transmission about death, about existence, but never arrive, wait repair, dream a way out of empire, undertaker's paradise, stacking the graves, lily whose lotus self is neoplatonic shadow, animal realm, synesthesia, realm of par Paracelsus, Jacob Bohem, antinomian long enough to come into light, Lily, to come into light, Lily, Lily, come from alienation, come to light, Lily, Lily is light, Lily, come from alimentation, come now, come now, hear voices, oh, Lily, 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 on the charnel ground, sing now, oh, Lily, walk in garden, come to light, Thelema, dilemmas, use, amuse, oh, Thel, Easternmost extent of Umayyad campaign stops here for idols in small boxes, destroys them. What if these symbols exist simultaneously with our schema, become human, atavistic, impregnated? What if Albigensian prophecy releases a soul from human coma? What if consciousness, soul, whatever, instance, life becoming flesh in transit returns and does harm? These were questions for end time. Trays of divinatory offerings in a school of rhetoric, eschewing mystery yet confused. Please advise, or do not enter here. Do not enter here. Star flowers shoot at dark of a distant galaxy. Anywhere out of this world, his heart is that big, and Dharma gates are endless. He enters every one of them. Extinction, extinction. Dear locator, scrambled. The desert is the rye. Zom. There was an incident involving daughter trauma apparitions. He held me, read ransom note in shaky hand. The pit not radicalized. Astonishment of Eros if you make a mess. Be revolutionary fervor. Astride jokiness, old mo. Oh, fuck that. Look into doom. Future is divination. Fell's riddle getting closer. Took another memo. Unborn was the challenge. Unborn dream. Unborn text. Aborted. Another chance. Another chance? Jury on afterlife out a long time. I was the old mole burrowing into the past and future of a telepathetic poetics to meet a daughter in outer space, to the one who dreamt a teacher in autun message delivered and working on it, assure you another telepathy, 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 telepath assignment. Andrea was amused, and we went about our tasks more circumspectly for the day. I'll stop there and end with a little, little ditty. I looked over Jordan, and what did I see? Drones over Jordan coming after me, singing the crimes of man. Got those Anthropocene, Anthropocene blues. Well, I looked into the crystal ball, and what did I see? Ghosts of the extincted ones coming after me. A heap of trouble coming, coming after me. Karma, karma, karma can't buck it. Karma, 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 we've done it 
manifest destiny. Man, oh, man, oh, manifest destiny. Looked into the crystal ball, what did I see? Cadres of humans taken to the streets. Cadres changing the frequency. Waking up to the anthro. Anthro. Anthropocene. Thank you. So if there's any burning questions, one or two burning questions. Anything? Take a moment. This is supposed to be a teaching occasion. I thought I was going to be in a room with like 10 people. I'm so glad you're all here. So tell me what you're doing. Okay, well, we'll all be hanging around a little bit longer. Okay, thank you so, so much. Yeah. Balance the escapism. How do you see it as escapism literature? Well, I was once working on a play with my first study, so I came from Indo and to my world with like an escape from the Indian reality. So I was looking at any that may be take uh, Indian Um well I think there's something about creating you know these alternative realities. I don't know if I ever see it as escape. It's always more it's more elucidating than that or it's something it gives you know when it's working it gives this again a kind of generative feeling that you take back or you integrate or you uh, you know it, it becomes part of you in a way. I mean I really go to literature as sort of sacred text. You know it's it's helps me live and survive. It's like light or food kind of necessity so and I think it you know the way it plays on your body on your imagination you know you cre even just reading alone by yourself in a little room you're you know transported often and you feel like you're knowing you know you learn things you're uh things are are lit up in you you're re reanimated um and you're sort of also feeling that you know what I was talking about a kind of, you know connection to being more human or, so I guess I, um, I mean, there is escapism, of course, and there are all kinds of other, uh, all kinds of things. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I would say I have a different category, but the balance would be, you know, sometimes creative, often people newly coming to writing or various practices have, have feel a conflict with, say, a meditative practice or if you're trying to, you know, free and free yourself of ego and, and attachment and so on, how can you uh, be making this other stuff? So, I, you know, that's a longer discussion, but I, again, I don't see, you know, ultimate, I mean, there are periods when it's important to unplug and not be busy. I mean, this was an argument with William Burroughs when he, went on his meditative retreat and uh, you know his conversation with Trunk we kept saying Trunk we kept saying well, you're not supposed to take writing implements or the typewriter in there and Burroughs would say but what if I had a really amazing thought and you know true insight and I lost that and of course he ended up taking his pad and pencil but and came out with a whole you know text called the retreat diaries but it's an interesting conversation I don't, I'm sorry I'm not answering it better, but I guess, you know, it, it's, I think it's more integrated than that. I think we, we need to be in a time where we're integrating all these aspects of our lives as well as other people's realities and suffering and their own um, hopes and fears and so on. I mean, it's a large task, but I would think that, you know, this work that, say, you're doing with making prose is, a gen is generative work, that there is a, you know, that something lingers that's helpful and useful and, and just illuminating whether it's useful or not. Poetry makes nothing happen, they say.
Anyone else? I know it's a much longer poem, exactly. Yes, right. It survives. Yep. No, no, come up and tell us more. Oh, yes. Yes. E L. Tendrell, yeah. Well, it's, I like to think it's like tendril, you know, that's why it's sort of easier to remember. It's, um, and I was using it because of thel, the word thel is incorporated in there. Um, but this sense of auspicious coincidence where, I mean, I don't know how to explain what that is. I mean, I, I think it's like being in this room together. You know, we're all on some similar track in a way and curious about, you know, being in community in this way and also have organized our lives to make it possible, you know, through the decision, the economic, all these layers of, of things. So, um, but then what can happen, I think, can be very um, unique. It's not, it's not just uh, uh, ordinary in some way. So it's, it's, and it's also this, again, like the, in the mind of the poet, all times are contemporaneous. You know that kind of quality as well, where you you can continue, you can be having a conversation in your head with Rambo or HD or whatever, and there's a you know there's a, a reality there. There's a kind of transmission. So that sense of transmission between um, connective beings, intelligences, thoughts, ideas, sound, dreams, and I you know this idea of this these this crisscrossing dreams that are, are come up in this text as well. The, all those are kinds of auspicious coincidences. Is that helpful? And I think they, are, they happen all the time. You just don't, th you think they're weird or you think they're somehow trippy or, but so, you know, I, so much of the path, my path with this place, you know, feels like a assignment. I mean, a great assignment. You know, meeting, just showing up. Someone, yes. Someone else had a hand up? Oh, sorry. Well, I think certain, you know, certain instances of it that, you know, one feels you have to record or witness and somewhere get into more profoundly are do, you know, bring the tone in a different, can bring the tone in a different direction. So that, I mean, you just pick up any newspaper here and, you know, the, the, the daily, uh, daily tally of suffering is so intense, but then it's how you, how you, um, in Buddha's practice, there's a practice called Tung Lin, where you actually, you invite it in, you want, you, you focus on it, you visualize, you, you know, the child dead, the migrant child on the, on the beach, the Turkish child, you know, you, you use that as part of, to trigger compassion and um, connection, and that you will be attentive to that, that reality in some way, and uh, support it as you can. We have, you know, in our catalog for the summer writing program, which Jeffrey helped put together as well. We try to describe this sense of the the theme is Indra's net, this sense of being interconnected, and then there's the literal high of the net high of the social media and the, the blessings and curses of that. You know, as we see, there's incredible, you can just be as ugly as you want on that as well. I mean, it, it's, there's a kind of neutralness to all our devices and instruments and so on. It's how we are awake and aware and, and you know, care, and so I think, yeah, for me, it uh, it does change. I have I was going to read one other piece, but I'll save it for another time. Which you know, I felt I had to respond to um, the the um, Carolina shootings and the you know the people in that, and so it became a sort of litany and written at, at the moment in the heat of it, and you know whether it works or not, and it's you know who am I to speak to that, et cetera, and you go through that kind of 
kind of thing. And then, but with this practice, it seems hypo maybe hypo hypocritical critical at first. You're not in the suffering yourself necessarily, although you can, there, there are many instances within your own experience and family and friends, extended people who've been in battle, people you know in your own family and so on. So you, it's just this connecting further. So then you find, to find a language that is refreshed with that, that's not just repeating. I mean, Ambrose is always, my son is always criticized. You know, you can't just sound like the New York Times or, you know, repeat the, um, you know, the grim language. So, again, you know, to challenge this sort of empire of that, of that, that cruelty, and I guess pathological, just, you know, we, we're just seeing so much illness in, in mental illness, I think in our world and, and the people who are, you know, applying for the job. I mean, I can't believe there isn't more of a job application for being president of this country. It's incredible, um, et cetera. So, um, yeah, it's how, you know, we're finding ways to work with it. I mean, I try to write some funny things too. All, all, do it all, both, both. Yes. Oh, Dina Hanuk, Dina Kut. There's a reference in uh, Elliot Weinberger's book, um, what's it called, Elemental Thing. And there, I saw another reference, it's a Mandian figure. It's, it's actually, I think there's an image of it. So, you know, there's a sense of writing. And, I, and this is an earlier version, so I play with that a little bit of other things. Able that Thel is her own book in a way, Thel only exists as a book. So I play with that, but it's um, no, it's fun to vi visualize your own body writing or your own half half gone in because the writing takes over. It's a great image. I can sp spell it out for you if you come up afterwards. Okay, well, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, and I wish all our new students a great uh, journey here. And I'll see you. I'll see you in the morning.